Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm going to start by giving you a short, if the presentation works, a short overview of uh, this morning's session. So, of course, the main aim of the event is to present the result and to give you an introduction to the Student as Digital Civic Engagers project. We will also invite you to test the tools and resources developed as part of the project. But this session is also an opportunity to discuss around the topic of student engagement and especially digital uh, civic engagement for students. So I will first present the SDC project and then we will hear a presentation from Maya Maximovic from the University of Belgrade about the course Adult Education for Activism, Activism and Human Rights, an example of digital student engagement at the University of Belgrade. We will also hear about uh, students' views of uh, digital civic engagement um, from, and more specifically from Ruben Jensen, who is uh, an executive member of uh, ESU, the European Student Union. He will give a presentation around the topic fostering student engagement through digitalization and learning and teaching. We will then have a Q&A session with Maya and Ruben, but also uh, we will invite uh, some of the students who were involved in the course of the University of Belgrade to join us and discuss about around the topic with us. And finally, we will have a short training session to invite you to test the tools developed as part of the project. So let me first start with an introduction to the Students as Digital Civic Engagers project. The project is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. It started in September 2020 and uh, is, it's still running until the end of August this year, so it's coming to an end. The project is coordinated by the University of Vienna in Austria and has a total of six partners among which three universities. In addition to the University of Vienna, we also have the University of Tartu in Estonia and the University of Minho in Portugal. You can, with organizing this event, is of course a full partner as a European network. And we also have two partners from Ireland and Northern Ireland, Momenta from Ireland, which is a training organization working with digital media, online and blended learning, and uh, on the design of learning platforms. And Canis Consulting from Northern Ireland, which is a small company specialized in vocational training and innovation support. This is the team. And now I would like to give you a little bit of background about the context in which the project was developed. So higher education institutions encourage civic engagement as an optional activity, as part of extracurricular activity, or as part of their study programs and allow then students to earn credits. But it's mostly done as part of the third mission of the universities. The SDC project seeks to promote a larger role for civic engagement, intrinsic, intrinsically linked to the quality of teaching and learning activities across all disciplines. And indeed, researchers have found a consistent and significant relationship between civic engagement and academic engagement. Engagement activities foster student civic responsibility, raises students' awareness for diverse community needs and social program, and equip them with the necessary competencies for facing societal challenges. Moreover, students who engage in uh, civic issues in, also engage in academic practice, linking theory and practice, and they can develop, therefore, some key competencies such as uh, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, or emotional intelligence. And at the same time, digital tools widen opportunities for civic engagement. In this context, the Students as Digital Civic Engagers project aims to empower students to become confident civic engagers, making the most of digital technology. Um, the project wants to do so by increasing awareness and commitment of higher education institutions regarding the benefits of teaching digital civic engagement, 
but also by providing training opportunities or teaching staff to enhance their digital pedagogic skills and align civic engagements with their academic programs of study. And the project wants also to provide self-led online learning opportunities for students complementary to their academic study. To achieve this objective, the project developed several tools and resources that I am going to present briefly. The first one is a guide to digital civic engagement. The guide draws on extensive research on student digital civic engagement from the six partner organizations. It focuses on the conceptualization of digital civic engagement in theoretical and empirical research and explores how digital civic engagement can be integrated on different levels of higher education at policy level, but also at teaching level and learning level. The objective of the guide is to build a compelling case for introducing digital civic engagement in two higher education institutions. It's targeting higher education managers who plan to implement digital civic engagement education in their institutions, but also educators uh, to whom it provides practical guidance on how to integrate digital civic engagement into their teaching. Here you can see uh, how the guide is structured. So in the first part, it provides some definitions around the concept of digital civic engagement. Um, in the second and third part, it uh, includes the results of a desk research and policy reviews on the topic of this digital civic engagement. The guide also includes 12 case studies uh, collected on the topic and teaching strategies. So as I said, practical guidance for teachers who want to implement digital civic engagement into their teaching. Uh, in addition to the guide, the project consortium also developed a toolkit which offers guidance and a selection of digital tools for higher education educators wishing to incorporate digital civic engagement activities into their curricular or teaching strategies, with a particular focus on increasing their confidence in using digital tools. So more concretely, the toolkit includes, includes a selection of 24 tools in six different categories. And each of the tools um, were selected because they can support digital civic engagement in several ways. So there are some presentation tools, crowdsourcing tools, collaboration tools, but also civic good tools. Those are tools that students can use to get informed or to get involved in civic and democratic, democratic issues. Um, the toolkit also includes digital creation tools and social technologies. Um, so social technologies are more networking tools thanks to which uh, students can engage with their peers, with educators and with the public to discuss um, civic and democratic issues. The toolkit is uh, made in a, an easy to use way. Uh, so each tool is presented in four different steps. First of all, there is a very brief definition of the tool in a nutshell. Um, then the toolkit offers a description of its advan main advantages and disadvantages. And it also offers some more interactive resources, mainly in the form of videos where educators or students can learn from others how to use the tools and see the tools in action. And uh, there are also, of course, some tutorial videos to get started with the tool. This was about the toolkit. The um, SDC project also developed a set of open education resources, which is flexible and which was designed to provide educators and academic staff with complete resources for introducing civic engagement and a means to engage students in real life examples that are relevant to their topic of studies. The open education resources um, include six different modules which are ready to use uh, for educators and they are downloadable in uh, PowerPoint format, which means that they can be adapted to their needs and to their students. Um, once again, the modules cover different, sorry, cover different aspects around the topic of digital civic engagement. 
The first module is uh, more of a general uh, presentation of the concept and how digital technology and new media um, are linked, can be linked with civic engagements. The second module presents the different opportunities offered for students around digital civic engagement. And the next module uh, cover topics such as uh, how to set up a digital civic engagement project, managing a digital civic engagement project, exploring funding, lean startup, and the power of corporate social responsibility. And finally, the final module um, covers the topic of marketing, civic engagement projects, goals, and collaboration. The modules can be used on their own or together, and they offer a variety of original teaching content, information, insights, and best practices. We will, of course, share all the links um, just in the chat just after. And the last tool developed as part of the project is a MOOC. Uh, it's based on the same content as the open education resources. So it also includes six modules with the same titles. And it provides students and staff with an additional space in which to develop their digital civic engagement. The objective of the MOOC is to increase digital skills and civic engagement knowledge to empower students to become confident civic engagers through the use of digital technologies. The MOOC is compiled to pass independently. Um, so anyone who's interested, whether students or educators, can take the MOOC uh, directly on the, on the website. And that's it uh, for the SDC project. At least, I hope it gives you a better idea of the project. On the website of the project, you can download most of the tools. Um, the rest of the tools will be added very soon. And um, in a further step this morning, we will invite you to test the tool and to give feedback. Thank you. Um, and well, right now, um, I would like to give the floor to Maya Maximovich for her presentation. Um, Maya is assistant professor at the Department for Pedagogy and Andragogy at the Faculty of Philosophy of the University of Belgrade, and she's a researcher at the Institute for Pedagogy and Andragogy. Um, Maya is also teaching a course, Adult Education for Activism and Human Rights at the University of Belgrade, and this uh, course what was used in a case study in the guide to digital civic engagement that I've just presented. So thank you, Maya, for being with us. And I give you the floor. Thank you, Julie, so much. Uh, well, it's, uh, thank you for inviting me to present, uh, to present the case and also for selecting it to be part of, uh, of uh, good practices example. Uh, I'm happy to hear that there, there are two, two of the students that actually att attended the course. So I'm looking forward to listen to, to the comments from them as well. So I will start my presentation now. Okay, so this is, uh, as you already said, uh, at, the faculty, at the Faculty of Philosophy, I'm teaching the subject, uh, the course, Adult Education for Activism and, uh, and Human Rights. And it has been an optional subject, I think, since, 2000, since 2014, if I'm not, uh, I think I, that's correct. Before that, uh, it was um, actually civic education and intercultural education, but um, we change it to adult education for activism. Uh, but it is uh, really the first question that I was faced with is how to, is it possible, is it actually possible to teach uh, activism? So how to, as you, as you already mentioned uh, within, the, within the, the presentation of the, of the project, what kind of competences are needed to be an active uh, active citizenship, but uh, uh, also what uh, what kind of attitude and how to my the question that I was faced with is actually how to organize 
classes? Is it possible to teach activism? Uh, what kind of education is needed so we can together develop some kind of agency? Uh, so here you can see the, the question was how to, how actually to develop uh, the course within a formal institution that would support students to actively participate in their environments, to influence power structure and to create an educational intervention that would actually challenge status quo, that would actually change something in their, in their community to address uh, certain issues that students are faced with. So when we ask that question, we, we, what, what kind of learning, my question was what kind of learning will develop, uh, will support students' agency? And uh, the, the regular uh, definition uh, by Council of Europe of uh, education for democratic citizenship, uh, it is that it, it is education, training, awareness raising, information practices and activities that will act, actually equip, just to, okay, let me, okay, now. So education for democratic citizenship means education, training, awareness, raising information practices and activities which aim by equipping learners with knowledge, skills and understanding and developing their attitudes and behavior to empower them to exercise and defend their democratic rights and responsibilities in society, to value diversity and to play an active role, active part in democratic life with a view to the promotion and protection of democracy and rule of law. So this is a definition of uh, education for democratic citizenship by Council of Europe from 2010. What I see as uh, what I see as a problematic uh, in this um, in this definition is that actually education should equip uh, learners and students with skills and with knowledge so they can be prepared for democratic life, which means that learning is some kind of preparation for democratic life instead of learning being itself, itself uh, democratic processes. So emancipation is an external intervention, but what, uh, what I found uh, important and what I found that was actually working within the classroom is when classroom is emancipatory itself. So we, um, together with students, we have to change uh, the architecture of the classroom in order to facilitate and to support agency, to support students to really be engaged in their community. So it is um, to, to summarize it and to put it uh, in a more practical way. Uh, if we, have outcome-based learning and if students should be equipped with skills and if there is only if uh, teachers or society or there is a national curriculum that predicts what students should do then uh, then unavoidably we can see um, that power relations it's very clear basically who owns the power because the power is in the in the hands of uh, of the, the position that actually sets the outcomes. Uh, of course, it is impossible to to claim that uh, I do not have uh, aims, educational aims. But my question was how actually to open curriculum and how we can work. On it, um, on it together. So equality is a primary value and the presupposition of education instead of being a desired outcome. So if we, uh, if we work with students and support them to map the issues that, are, that they are faced with in their environment, uh, to map the issues that they're faced in the classroom, we support we create basically we create space for them to also be engaged 
in their local environment, but also to develop this kind of uh, uh, not only critical attitude, but uh, to feel empowered that they can actually change something. And recently, uh, end of May, actually, I was uh, I was at a workshop. Uh, I was at a conference, CAA conference. Uh, the topic was uh, transformative learning and values, and we talked about uh, citizenship education. And there was uh, one interesting uh, comment made made by Laura Formenti from University of Bicocca and she Milano Bicocca, and she said uh, that it's uh, it is important to um, through education to change to try to change the identity of consumers to identity of citizens, which means that uh, sometimes when we when we engage with a group of people, I do not talk now only about uh, about students, but we, when we engage with uh, people, we com we complain about something. We complain that transport is not good enough, so we are we expect service to be provided to us, which is, uh, which is a kind of uh, consumer mentality. So what is the most, uh, basically as Laura, Laura well put it, what is the biggest challenge is to change the mindset from the one of consumer that something belongs to me. I paid something and I have rights to something and I will not basically do anything except complain about it to change it to, oh, okay, these are the problems and I have responsibility to change and I have responsibility to act. So I think this is the biggest, uh, let's say the biggest challenge in citizenship education, how actually to empower students that they can actually act and that they are in position to act. However, I would just like to stress that uh, nowadays, uh, due to marketization of higher education, we see that students are mostly treated as clients, uh, as uh, we all know that higher education nowadays is very much shaped and influenced by neoliberal, neoliberal ideology. And then if something is not uh, some services and content and uh, uh, should be provided to them. So it's very, again, I think uh, if, we, if we stay on that, uh, if we treat students as clients, it is impossible for them at the same time to be, to be citizen. So this, uh, this actually was, uh, I think this is a huge challenge how to transform, transform this, um, this mentality, which is very present in contemporary society. Uh, so when we want to teach uh, citizenship, uh, it's not only about learning democracy as an individual. Uh, so it's not only, uh, it doesn't end when uh, an individual, a learner, a student is equipped with certain skills that will uh, support him or her to participate in, in society, but it is about doing democracy as a collective. And we, uh, during, the, during the course, we read um, a text by Hannah Arendt, and it was, uh, we, uh, we read it during pandemic because this course was, uh, happened uh, throughout pandemic. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, she said that it is impossible to practice freedom in isolation. So we need collective action. We need to uh, share our struggle and collectively to act upon certain ideas. So what, uh, what was our idea back then is that learning democracy by practicing the right to the city so we focus very much on public space. We focus uh, very much on public space. And uh, I think we do actually focus on public space in 2018, but uh, in uh, within the course, but it was very, and it was um, very specific, specific uh, during the pandemic because we had a kind of uh, blended learning. So we had, we met once in two weeks in digital environment by using uh, 
any video video call where we would uh, discuss and talk about where we are at the moment but then students would would uh, get certain assignments based on their uh, based on their opinions based on what they shared and then during the two week time they would explore the city so uh, I understand that public uh, the public space is very is very important for a learning democracy, and uh, it is uh, it is uh, it is not created. This is not finished. It is not something that is done for us. But we constantly engage in creation of public space. So in 2018, that was the faculty. But during the pandemic, that was uh, public space was actually the city the streets around us. So learning is a participation in collective actions as a socio-political process of placemaking that challenges conflicted realities of public space and disturbs the greed of existing power relation and position. So with students, we engaged in the process of placemaking and that way we could, uh, we could develop uh, competences for civic engagement by doing collective action so the idea behind the assumption behind is that there uh, we we are not uh, that there is no linearity in learning so it does uh, we do not learn how to act we do not uh, gain skills for active for, for participation and then participate but it is uh, learning is stimulate uh, learning and creating are happen at the same time basically so we constantly negotiate what we want to do and then we 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 negotiate and then we engage at the same time and usually um, learning is something that happens more informally more unconsciously so we ask, uh, we always ask questions during this course, whose knowledge dominantly forms our everyday city experiences, uh, who organizes the city, uh, who creates the streets, who create, who create the atmosphere in the street, uh, who somehow, who creates our experience, how we walk, how we meet, uh, what we do, and what we can um, what we can notice nowadays is that um, actually again consuming city is very present so we usually whatever we do it's a uh, whatever usually whatever we do in the city we somehow consume some kind of services either we go for a coffee or we go for shopping so public we had the, an important discussion uh, if uh, shopping malls are new public spaces and we definitely decided they're not public spaces because our, our behavior is very is very defined and structured and public space is um is space it is a place where freedom can happen and it's it is definitely not owned by private uh, but pri by private sector and so occupying and redesigning public space transcends the one day event and becomes a universal claim for human and civic rights. So if we engage in transformation in public space, we somehow um, challenge the, uh, the present discourses and we uh, claim our rights. So city is the best possible, uh, the best possible classroom for civic education. Uh, we started uh, all usually at uh, this course, we start with the, the idea of public pedagogy, which is an educational process that focus on the concrete practices of citizens engaged corporeally in social interactions, which unsettle established notions of living together. And uh, the, what I emphasize here is to be engaged corporeally in social interactions which was very challenging during, during pandemic. And uh, I imagine that you face similar, similar challenges in, um, in your project is basically how to, how to engage digitally and how to change things through digital engagement. 
because it is very uh, that's why we decided that really we will have digital and physical presence both as uh, uh, traditionally um, civic engagement is you, it, for civic engagement it is important to be present to occupy space with your physical body which has symbolic meaning to be there so it is it is i found it really challenging how to while i was teaching how to combine digital and and physical physical presence but finally and i think you proved that throughout your project as well i could say that it actually actually works so how to i i will go back to the original question how to teach activism we are always at the beginning. It is a very, I would say it is a very challenging endeavor as all the time I'm at the beginning. I do not have, as a teacher, I do not have predefined outcome. I do not have uh, text prepared or what will I teach, what we will learn. But what I notice, uh, what is important to have is structure of time and space. So we meet regularly at certain time, once in two weeks for two or three hours. We have uh, uh, we have assignments uh, that we agree upon, but it is uh, it is uh, always a process in the making, as uh, because there is no predefined curriculum. But working with that emerge from students, and then we build together with them. So uh, also uh, we do not uh, for the exam. It is very, it is specific because we do not have individual exam, but we have collective exam, which is uh, contra the traditional intuition how exam should uh, should look like. But uh, they need to create a collective action and uh, collective action and. Uh, to do uh, educational intervention based on topic that they uh, they found find important. So in 2018, uh, they transformed they transformed the Faculty of Philosophy, and uh, they actually decided to create a learning environment out of uh, out of the hall, out of the second floor because we at the faculty, we only have libraries, but we do not have space where people would meet each other, where students can do their group project, where they just can sit and talk because they have uh, coffee shops around, but then they have to, they have to pay and it's very, very defined, the uh, spaces are very defined. So I encourage them and ask them how they can actually uh, transform this space. And if this, you, you can see these, uh, these chairs, they look like, um, uh, like chairs in a, in a waiting room. And the organization of uh, chairs suggests that basically hallway is only for waiting between the classes. So I will read the quote from students. We ask ourselves who created waiting space on the second floor of the Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade? Who has distributed those chairs and why there is nothing but them? For how long it has been like that and does it have to be so? Why do students behave in accordance with the design of space and the design of the waiting idea? Are we afraid to damage a frame that already exists or we unconsciously live it? So this was the first step for students to ask who actually created this space, who, uh, to whom it belongs. And finally, they discover at the end that the, it belonged to them. So they learn how to navigate within, within the faculty, whom to ask, whom to consult, uh, how to write letters to the management, et cetera. So through this initiative, they actually learned a lot about participation but i think what's most important is they learn to ask question that uh, the discourse can be 
uh, can be questioned, can be pro problematized. Who created this space? Why do we need to live it? Why do we expect? Um, why do we accept certain discourses as reality? So now you, you in this photo you can see how they actually transform transform the space for activities they are doing, and now how the the, the example how they learn to do it. At one of the lectures, we got freedom. Freedom to adjust the space that suits us, the freedom to move chairs, plants, and add whatever we want. After 10 minutes, it was no longer an empty space. Turn, rotate, move, and finally sit together with others. The feeling was different. We were no longer waiting. So we were, the, pub, the public space, what for them was public space, actually defined their activities. So instead of being engaged with others, they were just waiting. Uh, we were no longer waiting. We naturally sat down and talked, held a lecture. There was a place where it was created. Is freedom the keyword? Does anyone need to give us freedom in order to change something? And this is interesting that they say that they didn't take freedom. They didn't at the beginning, they got freedom. And uh, I noticed the similar similar notion in another student's reflection from the previous previous year that they were pleasantly surprised by freedom so i think uh, we go back to critical pedagogy and to bell hooks when she say when she says that um, classroom that uh, we need to practice freedom in the classroom but then we need to question to ask ourselves what does it mean to practice to practice freedom. So this is from 2019. We continued intervention in, uh, in, in the hallway. So basically students ask questions to their other, to their colleagues, but they uh, drew and wrote to what was important for them at the, uh, at the glass on, uh, on the faculty windows. So we also want to, want to provoke whose space is that by owning it, by creating an interventions. So this is, uh, this is the idea how we, uh, this, yeah, what, what was behind the learning methodology that uh, was initiated in 2020. As we all know, 2020 was the year of, uh, of pandemic. So it was, very difficult to to change as we already did the intervention in public space uh, we had meetings with other organizations and that also proved proved to be important uh, the city was our classroom we went together to exhibitions we went to theater we talked with activists we met with them we went to their offices. So basically we used the content from the city, but in 2020, that was impossible because uh, we had lectures online and we couldn't, we couldn't meet. So what we could do is to investigate the city, to learn by being in the world and to open to sensorial experiences uh, because this is also a way to learn how to be a democratic in a way that we do not on, only engage with our cognition. It's not only about critical attitude and critical thinking, but it is by being engaged with the world, by being engaged with material world and by uh, working with different ways of knowing, which I also find to be very important for, for um, civic education. And the ideas emerge from feminist epistemology that, uh, that uh, basically our education is very androcentric as it is very much focused on rationality, but how we can work with body, with emotions, with uh, how we can know the world through our senses. So we, the idea was that students uh, leave their houses and uh, engaged and do walks 
walking the city. So they got uh, tasks to explore the city by using uh, smell or touch or look to make uh, photos or to draw something or to make notes or to record sounds. So this was kind of investigation and research. And uh, after that, they, they were invited to, uh, I think Hana is here and this is her collage. Uh, they were inviting to create, create the collage of their experiences as well. So we use these different digital tools to invite their imagination and their uh, imagination that is actually critical toward how they see how they see the city. Uh, what emerged from all these walks is the topic of safety in the city. As the students start to uh, notice, they that they do not feel safe. It was mainly the female group. So the question of safety uh, emerged as a very important one. So they walked around the city and made these photos and notes. So one, uh, one of the students um, created these red photos and these are the spaces where she does not feel safe and um, normal photos uh, and you can see our building the faculty this is the, the faculty this is the space where she actually where she actually feels safe and uh, this is very very important topic because the public space traditionally do not does not belong to women and they often feel uh, they often feel unsafe and they feel afraid with um, in public space, which, which significant, significantly influence uh, their quality of life as they decide not to move, not to go to certain places or not to walk by themselves. So, or they do that, but they feel, they feel afraid. So we did this mapping and we met with, uh, with, uh, with an activist group, Do Not Drown Belgrade, which was very important to, to listen to, to share experiences. So uh, this activist group, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't talk to students, but together we engaged in the experiences of women uh, in public space. How does it feel? Uh, how does it feel when you walk alone? Why we do not feel safe? What kind, of, uh, what kind of experiences we had and who is responsible for that? But not only that, it was also what we can, we ask question what we can do together. Uh, after that, uh, students got tasked to continue this research. So first they map the city by themselves, but then they engaged in discussion with their colleagues, with their friends, with their parents to create one big map of Belgrade. If where do they feel safe and where do they not feel safe? And what are characteristics of these spaces? Uh, they did that, but due to pandemic, we actually never, never uh, complete an educational intervention in public space, unfortunately. And this is something that is still, that is still open. Uh, we wanted to, we had different ideas. Uh, one of the students suggested that we can, we can work with the students uh, from, from school, uh, from high, from, uh, philo philological gymnasium, uh, which is most um, and mostly girls go to their school, and that school is really near one place, Zeleny Venets, uh, which is uh, like a bus station, and which was mapped as a place where students felt really, really insecure. But we never. Uh, we never realized that project. We had uh, different ideas about how we can do it, 
uh, even to create uh, one of the idea was to create a digital map of Belgrade where, uh, where we would put research results and uh, to invite um, to invite other people to map the city. And I think that would be really interesting digital digital tool and I hope we will we will manage to do it one day. And for the end, I would just I imagine that students with all students uh, Anna and Dragan will also, share their experiences, but I would like to read uh, some anonymous uh, anonymous sentences from their from their reflection. Um, so um, uh, although there is a freedom, this is related to the question of public space, although there is a freedom, we feel afraid. We, we receive messages that uh, sh that we should be aware how we dress to choose only streets uh, with lights, never to, to walk alone during the night. Sorry. To be careful. And then they ask question, what is the public space and for whom? Uh, another quote that was important for our question, how to teach activism. It was important for me that we didn't, did not share only negative experiences but we generated ideas on how to make space safer, how we can, uh, how we can act together to create um, safe spaces for women. One more. During this course, I realized that I was not alone. For years, I thought that, was my, that my fear was just a personal paranoia, but now, but now I came to understanding that there is a reason for that. I shared my experience and I realized that this was not only my problem. Activism, activism is a way to work on it. And the last one, until that moment, I thought it was normal to be afraid at 2 p.m. That if it was normal never to walk alone when it was dark, to be afraid of the person who walks behind me. I did not even know that I felt insecure. I thought that it was normal condition. So I think I would uh, like to conclude with, uh, with this sentence. I even didn't know that I felt insecure, that, I, that it was normal condition. And I think this is exactly what we should work on together, uh, that uh, fear, and uh, dissatisfaction should not be normal condition, but when we share this experience and when we create space where together we can share this experience and work on it, we basically understand that we can, we can act upon. So this was, uh, this was my presentation. I hope uh, it was uh, it was interesting, and I'm curious to hear to hear the students if they have uh, if they have comments or if if they want to share something. So thank you for the invitation, and I'm looking forward for further participation. Thank you, thank you, Maya. It's it was super inspiring. I think, and it's also very interesting to see how different the, the activities are between the different years and how, and it's, it's, it's very great to have also the, the feelings from the, from the students. So yeah, thank you very much. The, the project has developed some, some tools and resources, but I think what is most important is to have uh, experiences like yours, real experiences, and that can inspire other university students. Thank you. Um, well, now I don't know if um, we should do it now or later, but uh, Anna and, and Dragana, if you agree, I would like to help. <laughs> Good to see you. I would like to, yeah, to invite you to, to react to Maya's presentation and to share your experience, uh, maybe since you both uh, were involved in, in the course that Maya presented. So, give you the, the floor. Um, sure, I can start if that's okay with Ragana. Um, well, it was really interesting to listen to the presentation because I 
um, I was before this um, event, I was trying to remember things that we did, so it was helpful to see it um, again. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if the course was uh, really something new. And at first it was very confusing having all that freedom. I think our professor can agree that we were like very, like we, we weren't sure what was happening and uh, it was kind of difficult for us to accept that we had the freedom to actually um, talk about things that we wanted to talk about and kind of guide the course the way that we wanted to guide it um, because we, we were we just weren't used to it we weren't we never got that freedom in like an institutional uh, environment um and um, it was uh, interesting to find ways to um to learn about activism because at first i was doubtful that the course was going to be successful because of the pandemic and because everything was online because we'd heard experiences of our um colleagues from former years that it was an inspiring course and it was like in person uh but it was um uh, interesting to kind of uh, move it in a digital in a digital space um and um make it our own uh, and uh, looking at these photos and these maps that we did i uh, kind of um I'm, I'm kind of uh, inspired again and I can see that we actually did something even though we weren't able to like do an uh, educational intervention so it was uh, yeah it was a, a new experience and a really good one and um, these quotes at the end uh, I agree with everything that some of my colleagues wrote and I, I think I had similar reflections as well that was very helpful to kind of talk to uh, people in my close environment about things that we don't really talk about that are kind of taken for granted i guess uh, because we talk about them online with people across the glo globe but we don't necessarily talk about it with people in our environment and so it kind of uh it seems like it's fictional to actually do something and taking this course actually made it seem as if we can actually do something in our community so yeah, those are my experiences. Uh, my experiences are uh, similar. Uh, at the beginning, to be honest, I thought it was pointless because we were just going around and walking, which, which now I know it isn't because to be honest, it was my favorite part because I got to know myself. So I would say it was that course was kind of tiaparut I'm sorry, therapeutic, uh, and I got to know myself what I want to do in um, uh, in my city, what I want to do better. Uh, so uh, that really made me start thinking what I can do to change things. Um, so yeah, that that's like my main. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't used English in a while. Um, so yeah, I think that that course was really, really, really great, even though it was online. So uh, I hope like next generation will have it face to face because I think it can be better face to face because you see people every day. But as Anna said, um, I got to work around in digital space, uh, work uh, in, on different platforms, which is really important. We used, I think, Milanote for maps, and it was a new platform that um, that we made our big city. So, and I liked seeing uh, other people's works that I, maybe I couldn't see face to face. So yeah. I wouldn't add anything more because Anna said everything to be honest. Thank you, Anna and Dragana. It's really great to have your experience. Can I ask you, um, were you invo like involved in activism or civic engagement before the course or was it your first uh, experience? Um, I think in my experience uh 
I wasn't because to be honest, I was scared. I was scared to go uh, to go out of my comfort zone, but things kind of changed after this um, subject uh, because uh, I learned what I want to do. I participated. There were a lot of protests, and I wasn't uh, before. I would be like, um, I don't want to get in trouble, but sometimes getting in trouble is maybe the right way to do it if it's for the right cause. So uh, yeah, that's my answer. Um, for me, I mean, similar as, as Ragana, uh, when I was younger, it was mostly like uh, in digital space, but um, it was just like information sharing pretty much. Um, but I grew up uh, kind of in the Balkans, activism is almost a necessity. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, so my parents are like, they were very much involved in activism, like in the 90s and uh, before that. So um, that's kind of how I was raised. But um, it almost um, before this course, it almost seemed kind of pointless in a way because here things are really difficult to change uh, but I think something that I learned uh, in the course is that we don't have to like necessarily work on really like grandiose big things that we can start with our community and our on our on like smaller things and then work our way up uh, influence things that we can actually influence so that was kind of encouraging for me okay thank you so it's interesting to see that it's really it's really changed something. It really brought you something additional. Um, and Maya, can I can I ask you if uh, this is something that you saw uh, in general from your students that they were somehow I don't maybe not uh, actively well, engaged in activism before, but that the course encouraged them to really bring it to another level. Mm. Well, uh, I first I want to thank. Uh, I'm very grateful to Anna and Dragan that they they join us here together, and it is uh, lovely lovely to see you. Hope you're doing well, that you're passing all exams, <laughs> and uh, it is the middle of exam period. Uh, so I I would like to address the confusion at the beginning uh that they had at the beginning because it is uh, it is usual that uh, students at the beginning feel very confused because uh, it, it is like sometimes they feel uncomfortable even some of the students feel angry that they do not have clear structure there is no content what should i learn what i'm learning this is useless this is pointless so there is this reaction and at the beginning when i started working like this i was really I was uh, afraid. I was like, oh, I'm going out of the teacher role. Should I do this this way? But then throughout the years, I noticed that this is natural. This kind of resistance, let's say, is always present. So for me, it was learning how to go through this resistance, how to go through this unknown, through uh, accepting students' confusion, that it is, we do not have always as teachers, we do not have always to provide something, to provide content, to provide, uh, to take them out of uh, feeling of confusion, to give them answers. We can facilitate this space of one unknown and to trust that something will emerge in that. So I think uh, at the beginning, when I start, when I, uh, start uh, started with this uh, kind of uh, experiment. I didn't really know, but uh, in years I I start I um, I became trustful, and I trust that something will uh, that they that they will develop this activist uh, mindset. And I think uh, what what they say is really what you say, Anna and Dragana, is really important for me that it, uh, yeah, like you discover that you have uh, agency, that you do not have to work on grandiose uh, projects, but that you can really address 
what is going on in, in your community. And I heard several times, I heard fear, being afraid to participate, being, so I think the, the, the education is very much also an emotional process, let's say. So it's not, not only learning how to do something, but um, sharing, uh, sharing this fear. Oh, can I, can I join? Uh, will I get myself in the trouble? So I think these are, and I, I, these are areas that we work on, but I always discover something new when I, when I listen to you. And I didn't know that it was therapeutic process. And I think that was important for also, yes, also what I also wanted to achieve, to, to achieve, to, to work with you, what, uh, because they were stuck in the house during pandemic. And I want to wanted to invite them to go out. Uh, we could only have walks in the city and they could walk together. So I, I think um, one of the aim of the course was to address the situation, um, to, to address the, the situation that we were all in uh, and, to and to use learning methodology to provide some kind of uh, belonging, that they belong to this community of walkers, let's say. So uh, I think it's always working with what you have, like this is it, we work, we work on that now, we, we walk. And uh, some of students walk together, if I, if I remember well, some of them walk alone, but some of them walk together, which I think was good to get out of the house and just walk. You find you found them. it's good to see you reacting to each other's words. I see that Diana has a question or comment. Diana? No, it's more maybe a comment. Um, I would just wanted to say um, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, also, I, I wanted just to point out that I think this topic is so important because, um, especially in those days, we have so many big global problems political um, catastrophes. And I think civic engagement empowers ourselves and, and motivates us um, to um, be active and to have an impact somehow. And um, I think this is especially in those days very um, important because I think if you just, for example, watch um, the news, then you feel so powerless. But if you start working and start being active in your surroundings, what everybody is able to do then you um have this you, you realize that you can do something and um for a better world to say it like that and so thank you very much that's just what i wanted to yeah. mention thank you so much diana i completely agree with you and i read somewhere i don't know where that um uh, we are nowadays we are we are more influenced than we react so, for example, when we receive information, we do not react. We just receive those uh, that information. So I wonder how, and it is overwhelming. So what you said, like those political problems that we are facing are overwhelming. But I think with sensorial experience, if we engage with our sight, with our smell, if we look at our surrounding, we can react, we can act. Like we got information and then we react. But if we just receive all these news and we feel powerless, we do not react. We are just uh, paralyzed. So the, the, our close environment invites us to join, invites us to change. And we are basically very much influenced by this. Um, we are very influenced with our immediate surrounding. Do we feel safe or we do not feel safe? Uh, what do we want? Do we? Is it easy to walk in in Belgrade streets? It's not easy to walk. So what are what are the questions that we are facing now? Now we are facing another problem that I'm really uh, I don't know what what about you, but uh, I heard that students are have problem with the rent that uh, the rents are increasing and uh, it's a huge it's a huge problem. So we 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 can we will see if we can work on that. 
yeah, it, it's a, a complex topic. But I hope that with a uh, project of this type, uh, with your course, with the, our discussions today and the video, we can at least encourage other to, to react to what we have around us. Um, we can continue the discussion maybe a bit later with Ruben also, because I see that she, he joined us. But um, hi, Ruben. Now I would like to, to give you the, the floor. Uh, so Ruben is a member of the executive committee of ESU, the European Students' Union. His work has focused on student-centered learning, digitalization of education, and mental health, among other topics. And um, now he will give us a presentation around the topic of fostering students' engagement for digitalization and learning and teaching. Ruben, the, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Maybe um, we need to make it more Yes, I think now I can share my screen. Uh, yeah, that seems about right. All right, so, so thank you very much. Um, I'm, uh, like you said, uh, uh, Ruben, I'm a member of the executive committee at ESSU. Um, you mentioned a few of the areas that I work with. In ESSU, we, we try to connect students from all over Europe um, and to well, represents the students' interests, of course, at the European level and talk about the issues that are really important for students. Um, so one of those things is, is the quality of education, of course, and in that, how we use digital learning and how we use learning and teaching. Um, so that really means overall, what does our education look like? What do, does the curriculum look like? What does what happens inside of the classroom look like? Um, and what actually are we trying to achieve with our, our education? And I think, those are the methods that we need to use in order to foster student engagement. Um, because I've heard just a little bit of the last presentation and of your uh, discussion, but um, I hear some of those things like encouraging students to actually participate and to be engaged in society. That's something that's a culture that, that we need to uh, instill in the students and that we, we need to create, but we need to do that throughout the entire education. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how, uh, how we think that we can do that. But why do we need to do that? So let's go back to those societal challenges, those global challenges that we face. I heard a few just like uh, climate change, the social injustice, misinformation. There's so many more. And we need to train the students to be able to um, handle those challenges because they're the ones that will have to do it. Well, we're the ones that will have to do that in the future. Uh, but beyond that, we also have more challenges in higher education as well that are maybe more specific to the education uh, sector. The number of students, for example, is growing uh, very fast and the student bodies are becoming more diverse as well. Students want a bigger say in their education as well. Um, there is competition between the institutions. We see that new technologies are, are arriving in higher education um, and during the pandemic of course we've had to, to embrace these at a much faster rate that we that we've ever expected, um, but that's also enabled us to actually feel maybe a bit more comfortable with, with those technologies and now think of how we actually want to use them. And also, those new technologies um, have enabled different ways of offering education, such as short courses, online courses, and they provide a bit of a challenge to higher education, like the traditional higher education institutions. So we need to think: how do we tackle all of those challenges, um, and how do we really train the students? to be ready for the future. So these challenges raise a number of questions uh, for higher education, such as what is a traditional university degree really still worth? Uh, what is it worth to actually be physically present at the campus? Uh, what do we actually want the students to learn in higher education? What should be within the program? How much theory should be there? How much practice? Um, how much should we be addressing the social societal challenges that we just mentioned? Um, should we uh, make higher education more individual as well, um, as we've already been doing a while, or should we maybe go back to a bit more traditional teaching and learning methods? Um, to what way will we use those digital tools? Will we use big data and artificial intelligence to monitor um, and govern the education as well? And in general, how do you govern a university? How do you engage the students in this? How do you engage uh, teachers in this? Those are all questions that we really need to ask ourselves right now. And they're all connected uh, because they all are important in making the decisions on how we design teaching and learning, how we design digitalization and how we want to govern a university. 
Um, so, like I said, we really want to train the students to address those global challenges. They're the experts of the future. Um, but that also means that they need to be trained in how to engage with those challenges and how to engage with society. Um, and for that, we need to engage them already during their education, because otherwise students will never learn how to actually do it. I, I just heard in the last discussion that uh, students may be a bit confused or overwhelmed uh, if there's uh, a lack of structure, if it's not very prescribed, uh, what and how they should follow this course. Well, I mean, that's also what the real world is like uh, often. And in order to avoid those problems, we need to really train students and make them comfortable in um, addressing uncertainty and uh, addressing those problems. And we need to do that from the first day that they arrive in higher education. Uh, so for that, first, we need to design the learning and teaching strategies in order that students are involved all the way through to we need to make use of digital learning technologies in the, the best way possible uh, that means also to make sure that students are involved with each other and with the education and in all of those processes including the design processes we need to involve the students as well so i'll start a little bit with the uh, learning and teaching part um, and and as we embrace the philosophy of student-centered learning, this is also a philosophy that has been embraced in the Bologna process for um, a long while already now. Uh, but let me just like focus again what exactly this is. So if we look at more traditional learning and teaching methods, we call this teacher-centered learning and teacher learning and teaching. And in there, students are really passive recipients of, of the knowledge. Um, the teachers are the main source of knowledge and students uh, just sit there in uh, typically like this mass lecture, uh, they take notes, they listen to what the teacher is saying, um, they have to memorize this and at the end there's one big exam where you have to reproduce all of this knowledge. Um, this is really a passive and uh, more traditional way of doing learning and teaching. And on the other side, uh, side we have the student-centered learning and teaching and there students are actually actively participating and this leads to um, deep learning as well. Uh, students will have a better feeling, will have more knowledge and experience with what we're actually trying to teach them. And that means that they actually understand what's happening and they're better able to use this knowledge and those skills in the future. Um, and for that, students have to take responsibility for their learning um, and they have to participate and influence the process as well. Um, that means that they, they are responsible to say, okay, I will do these things. I will set my goals within the framework that the teacher offers. Um, and I will engage myself to go on the path to actually achieve those outcomes as well. Um, and this means that learning happens both inside and outside of the classroom um, because students have diverse backgrounds. That means they have a lot of different experiences. They need to bring those experiences that they have from outside of the classroom, inside of the classroom, to be able to connect the knowledge and the skills that they learn in higher education to uh, what they've experienced outside. Um, and also they have to bring it back to already apply this knowledge and, and think about how to uh, be engaged as an expert in a certain scientific field, which is what they're becoming, to the real society. And for that, we need this continuous connection with the society around them. Now, I talked a bit about the, the, the passive, the traditional learning and teaching methods. Uh, there are problems with these methods when we uniquely apply this passive learning and teaching. Uh, and that is that this is just not fit for a diverse student group. As I said, the group of students is becoming more and more diverse. Um, I mean that in a socioeconomic point of view, in an ethnic point of view, um, also in uh, just the age of the students and the phase of life that they're in. Uh, we have this maybe predefined conception of, of students as being between 18 and 25 uh, and being a full-time student, but that is really uh, not the case. And I know that differs a lot uh, within Europe as well, but it's also changing that more students are maybe older, have some industry experience already, um, and are maybe working or having care duties as well. Um, and you need to make sure to address all of those students. And you can't do that when you have just one big lecture cannon uh, shooting at, at this big uh, heterogeneous group of students. Also, students are just not engaged. Um, we see that students are not taking action. They are not proactively engaging with the learning materials. Maybe just like at the end of the semester, they will go through the learning materials um, just with the goal of passing the exams. I know I've done that. Um, and, and that's not actually achieving the attended learning effect. Uh, for that, we need to be engaged with the materials throughout the entire semester. And for that, we need to have this application goal in mind as well. 
um, and this link with the society and the challenges. Uh, further, there's no really room for spontaneous interaction in these traditional learning and teaching methods. Um, and that, that means that the students are not educated in such a culture of interaction and uh, proactivity and engagement. Um, and that means that when suddenly they have this opportunity to do that, maybe some uh, course that is designed in a special way, that this is really maybe a shock <laughs> and students are just not prepared to actually engage with the materials in such a way. Um, so we need to design the learning and teaching spaces in order to actually provide uh, this uh, the, the opportunity for interaction and to support them uh, in this as well. And that also means that students need room to fail. If we want students to actually engage and not be afraid to be engaged, that means that they need to be able to, to experiment with this uh, in their own way and receive feedback, uh, but have it be okay if uh, that doesn't work out on the first try or in the second try. And the third, the fourth problem that we have is uh, a lack of, of sense of belonging. So um, there, yeah, if, if you're in this mass study program, if there's not really in, any interaction with the teacher uh, and with your fellow students, then of course, you're not really going to feel like you belong in this program. You're not gonna be motivated to continue um, in this program. You're not gonna be engaged. And that's also gonna, um, contribute to actually missing the learning outcomes uh, and not being as engaged uh, in the end. Now, I just want to mention as well, I'm very critical here of the passive and traditional learning and teaching methods. Um, I don't want to banish um, mass lectures. That's not what we stand for um, in ESSU, but you need this mix of different ways of how to engage the students um, and how to teach them uh, and engage them in learning. So then what is student-centered learning itself? Uh, well. Here, we start from what learners should be learning instead of what the teacher will be teaching. Um, having this kind of output first philosophy uh, means that you're able to address this diversity of students because um, otherwise, okay, if, if learning is just designed in a way, we will be handling this and this and this and this topic. You don't know what the prior background of an experience of the students is. Um, you don't know what the expectations of the students are. And, that means that some students will not be motivated, not be interested or not be able to follow. Um, and then we miss out on, on the actual um, learning outcomes that we want to achieve. The second thing is the autonomy and responsibility that students should have. So I already said that um, students have to take responsibility for their own learning, um, but that also means that they need the autonomy to be able to do that. We are in higher education, the students are adults, uh, and that means that they want some autonomy as well. Um, and that means that, that students should be taking some decisions themselves on the format uh, and the content of the courses. Um, what exactly within the, the framework of the course, of course, but what exactly do the students want to tackle, want to achieve? Uh, maybe what kind of societal problems do they want to address? Um, and how do they do that? Students can get a say as well in exactly how uh, the teaching and learning is, is happening, uh, what kind of methods are being used, the logistics, the practicalities, um, involve students in this as well. And that means that teachers will take on a different role. Um, they, uh, they kind of are guiding the students um, in order to achieve the learning outcomes that they put forward. Um, but students have autonomy within the framework that the teacher uh, provides. And that means that you need a different role of the assessment, not just one big summative assessment at the end, but uh, smaller formative assessments uh, that allow the students to learn throughout the semester. They motivate students um, in, to, to actually engage with the materials throughout the year. Um, although you do still need uh, space for autonomy of the students as well, not just prescribing what they need to do uh, because that's going in the other direction. Um, and you need feedback. Uh, you need to make sure that students throughout this semester, uh, throughout the different assessments, uh, learning experience that they have, they get some constructive and personal feedback in order to learn and to adjust their own learning paths and learning strategies in order to actually achieve the outcomes uh, and not just have feedback at the end in one big score because you don't learn anything from that. You don't know exactly what you're able to do and what you're not able to do, and you don't know what you should be doing differently. Um, so that's why feedback is so incredibly important to actually achieve this. And the big things uh, that I've already mentioned a little bit is 
how this is all about the social experiences and the societal um, engagements. So in order to actually learn deeply what we're trying to learn as a student, we need the social experiences. We need to connect with our fellow students and with the teachers and with outside actors as well um, to just exchange with them, uh, to see, okay, how do other people look at these problems? Um, to learn through discussing these materials or through working together uh, in trying to design solutions for, uh, for these problems. Um, and for that, you need to put uh, the, the students together and the teachers together um, so they can work with the course material, uh, work together on projects and actually also already apply the knowledge that they're trying to gain. Um, and in such a way, develop a much deeper understanding of the, of the material and also develop an identity and already know what can I do with uh, this material that I'm, I'm, I've been given uh, in higher education here. And with that, we can also make this connection with uh, the societal role of the university and the societal challenges that we are facing. Um, because students are being trained to become an expert in their field. That means that they're also being trained to become an active member of society afterwards. And that means that they should think about how to apply their knowledge uh, and their skills to these societal challenges that we face. And these challenges are interdisciplinary. Uh, you can't just uh, address them as a narrow focused uh, expert, but you need to collaborate with other people from other disciplines and you need to think critically about um, your knowledge and about uh, these challenges as well. So the students shouldn't be exposed to the real world for the first time um, when they come out of university, when they've graduated and maybe start their first job. Um, but we need to do that already during the education. Um, and for that, we need to use the diversity of the students that, that's in there. We have, like I said, a body of students that is growing to be more and more diverse, and we can actually use this. Um, we, can, uh, we can use and look at the background that all students have, the skill set that all students have, because this will be different in some way, and they should learn how to combine all of these strengths uh, in order to actually address challenges and make solutions uh, based on the knowledge and the skills that they're learning. Um, all students bring something different to the table and we need to have the space to let the students bring this to the table and use this to actually uh, apply the knowledge. And for that, you really need a culture of collaboration. Like I said, this shouldn't be something that students are only, uh, well, encountering after being graduated or at the end of their studies, but already from the first day, uh, you need to make space to let students actually engage, to let them ask questions, to let them discuss with each other, to let them do projects, um, try to design solutions with their knowledge and skills. Um, and we need to guide them in this as well. And that's the role of the teacher too, that uh, they can grow in this, be guided more in the beginning and be let more free at the end, um, because that's how you grow as well. We don't just uh, throw people for the rules. Um, and the thing is that students are really longing for such programs, the programs that um, have these social experiences, make use of the diversity, are collaborative, and are also facing societal challenges. We see more and more um, study programs that are uh, really being marketed as, as something uh, to face sustainability issues um, or, or gender and diversity, um, social inclusion, all of those things. And now, students are attracted by those things, are attracted by the interdisciplinary uh, approaches as well. So that means that we also need to do that, not just at a marketing level and uh, give our courses and our programs a, a, such an attractive name, but also do that within the course material that we have, and not just in one course, but in the entire study program. And to actually achieve, to achieve this, we need to involve the students in this process as well, because I've, I've talked now about how to involve students within the learning experience, but this it goes broader than this. We need to involve the students in how the higher education institution works it, it itself as well, because that's kind of a mini society on its own. And there are already plenty of opportunities to um, engage students. And if we don't do that there, we can't expect uh, students to be able or to want to do that outside. So when we're talking about how the teaching and learning is designed really okay what is what are we going to put in this course and how are, are we going to do this traditionally this is done by like one professor on their own who's not even a trained pedagogical expert um so of course that doesn't really work out to the best um, you can be very lucky but that can also go wrong so rather we need collaboration collaboration between different teachers uh with pedagogical experts as well 
um, but also with students. We need to involve students in this pro uh, process from the design of the learning experience all the way to the implementation and to the evaluation of this as well. In every single step of the way, uh, we need to involve students, ask them what they want, what they think of proposals and how they would do it differently. Um, and when we do that, we act we're actually also decreasing the distance between the student and the teacher. That means that we are creating this culture of engagement and creating a culture of trust as well between students and teachers. And that helps for the good functioning of the university, that helps for the good quality of the education, but also that helps to train the students to become um, already engaged in society, in their higher education and uh, with the course material that they're, that they're being trained at. Um, and so I, I added a, a little bit of this as well. There's different ways to involve students. Um, I, I, I've seen that this really depends throughout Europe, throughout the education institutions on how to do this. Um, some of the traditional um, methods are of course like sending out surveys, asking students uh, what is their experience or, or what their ideas are. But of course, that's not enough. You can't just um, use quantitative data to uh, improve your uh, learning processes. You also need to actually start a conversation. And for that, you can do things like focus groups, as I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell um, all of you. You can actually have this, this discussion and go deeper into what do we actually now need to do to address the challenges. Um, further, there's also student representatives who have a permanent place in, uh, in councils in um, places where this decisions are being made. But even that's not enough because you need to support the student representation as well. You can have things like uh, contact persons at the institution that the students uh, can go to in order to get support. Information is incredibly important. If they don't have um, correct information already about how the institution works, um, then they can't engage in, a, in the same way as uh, as teachers, for example, of, or as staff of the university because students are here for a much shorter time so that means that they need to be supported in this process of being engaged. Um, and for that, we have strong students unions as well. Um, they, if there's a strong student union, that will automatically support the engagement of students, but that needs to be supported as well. Make sure that those students have the time and the resources to actually do the student representation. But all in all, it really comes down to establishing trust uh, between everyone in the higher education institution and just establishing a continuous dialogue. We need to talk to each other. Um, in order to improve the quality of education and make students more engaged. And to do that, we need to start within the classroom. Uh, we need to start there to um, talk between the teacher and the students, be open to feedback from students and uh, give students autonomy and responsibility in their own learning process. And then everything else will build upon that. But we need to really start up within the classroom and from the first day that students are in university. Um, so um, I, I was asked to talk a little bit about the digital side of this as well. So I will shortly talk about digital learning too, um, because we've had this experience in the COVID pandemic of suddenly using much more uh, digital tools, but um, this all went very quickly uh, and maybe not always in the best way, but there now we need to think together on how to actually do this uh, properly. Um, how to make use of these digital tools so that they have the best pedagogical outcome um, and that they support the students best in learning what they need to learn. Um, so what is actually the advantage of digital learning? Well, if we use digital learning methods, we can make education more student-centered, like I said. Uh, we can also make it more accessible, uh, more international, more flexible uh, and more well-rounded in general. Um, and we can do that through offering a diversity of learning and delivery methods. Digital tools offer to um, offer students with multiple ways of actually achieving uh, their learning outcomes uh, with lecture recordings and online learning paths and uh, papers and other textual materials and, and things like this. And if there's this diversity that will better fit the learner's needs because the learners will be able to choose what is the, the um, what are the, the methods that best fit to them and to experiment with this as well. Uh, and that provides necessarily flexibility for this uh, learning group that is becoming more and more diverse. Um, so we see that digitalization is a tool to achieve all of these goals of quality and accessibility and flexibility, but it can't be the goal in itself. Uh, we're not gonna use digital tools just because we want to use digital tools. We want to use them to achieve better education. 
Um, so what does this look like ideally? Well, it is about student-centered learning. Like I uh, introduced before, with digital learning, we can put the learning before the teaching because we can offer these really flexible and diverse learning methods for the students. And uh, we can adapt uh, the learning path to the needs and the context of each student uh, because we can offer these different methods and we can also uh, automatically adapt the methods that are, uh, are offered to the students based on how they've been performing before as well. Um, and incredibly important in all of these digital learning methods uh, is interaction, no matter whether it's a synchronous or asynchronous activity, whether it's video-based or an uh, online lecture or um, online discussions, everything. This digital learning should actually be increasing the amount of interaction that we have between students and between the students and the teacher. Um, they need to encourage discussion and active participation because the relationships are super important within um, within education. There needs to be this trust and this constant exchange of knowledge between students and teachers. And for that, we need to have digital methods and face-to-face -face methods complement each other. Use all of them for what they're um, uh, suited best. And when we use digital learning, these learning activities should be stimulating dialogue by design. So that means that we should adjust the learning activities to this. The chat room in an online uh, lecture is not the same as being able to ask questions or discuss in, in real life. Um, and that's really uh, an online forum as well is not the same thing for discussion. So we really need to modify the learning activity to make sure that students are actually doing it and, and feel safe uh, while, while interacting like this. So how do we achieve this? Um, well, a lot of universities have institutional plans and now is really the time to make this a long-term vision on how to use um, digitalization in a post-COVID way. Uh, and for that, institutions should first of all think what will what is the impact of students' learning uh, of these digitalization um, methods and how can we improve the quality and accessibility of learning? So those are the three questions. One, um, how can digital learning actually enhance the, the students' learning? Two, how can be, students be involved in every step of the way? And three, how do we allocate the necessary resources for this process? Um, so this is pretty similar to what I said earlier about how to involve the students. Um, we need to involve all of the stakeholders, including students and teachers, in every step. Um, so that means when thinking about uh, what kind of digital learning activities we want to use, when choosing or developing a digital tool or platform, um, there's a lot of educational technology companies out of there, um, but sometimes it feels like they're dictating our pedagogical vision, while it should be the other way around, uh, because institutions should develop their own pedagogical visions, and the uh, we need to then develop the tools um, or make use of the tools that are able to achieve this pedagogical vision, um, and students should be involved in this process as well of how to choose um, which tools to use. And continuously through throughout the implementation of digital learning, students should be involved asking what is the effect uh, that you feel? How do you feel about these methods? What would you do differently? Um, and afterwards also evaluating the effects like this. This is really a constant feedback loop. Uh, we already have very well uh, worked out quality assurance systems in higher education, but we need to integrate digital learning in this as well. Um, and to achieve all of this, we need the necessary resources on one hand, uh, infrastructure, digital learning tools and platforms should be reliable. Um, of course, we need to be able to access them when we want um, and how we want, but they should be accessible as well. During the pandemic, we saw that a lot of students actually don't have access to digital learning methods, and that was maybe a bit invisible before, but now we really see it. They maybe don't have um, a computer that is powerful enough to, to do this or that they can use by themselves the entire time. They don't have a broadband internet connection or a quiet room um, to actually engage with the online lessons in. And that's all really important to ensure an equitable uh, access to education. And all of this needs to be secure as well. Um, data should not leave the university um, and it should be really uh, clear who has access to which data of, of students. Um, and the other side is the, the human resources uh, for both staff and students. Um, staff should need should be um, creating the pedagogical skills, it should be 
uh, learning how to actually design uh, digital learning experiences in a way that is uh, pedagogically positive, uh, that is actually making sure that the students will achieve the learning outcomes that they want. Um, both staff and students need digital literacy. Um, yesterday I was in another meeting where students uh, were talking like that they didn't have very fast typing skills before and suddenly had to, um, to, to learn this. Uh, and that's something that we also don't see. We think, okay, this generation of students is uh, very fluent with digital platforms, uh, but that's not always the case. We need to um, uh, allow them to learn all of this as well. And that means transversal skills, such as um, critical thinking about uh, online data and uh, online information, making use of all of the resources and the information that is out there. Uh, that's a super important digital skills skill for them to learn as well. Um, and further, staff needs the time and the recognition to develop um, these digital learning tools, um, and they need to the support resources for that as well, and the students too. In an online learning environment, you also need um, the people to talk to, the, the mental health support, the libraries, all of these things. So I think that's clear that even if we want to use digital learning, uh, that can't be an excuse for reducing investment. It's not going to cost less. Uh, we can just achieve better things with it. Um, and I talked a little bit with the, the, about the educational uh, technology sector as well. We need to think critically about our relationship with them uh, and rather we should actively be collaborating with them, um, analyzing the needs of the students and the teachers and make sure that there's collaboration to actually have them develop the platforms that we want um, to conform to the divisions that we want. So to put everything back together, we want to train students to address those global challenges, to be engaged. And for that, we need to engage students already throughout their education. And we need to do that from the first day that students are in education in, in a university. Uh, we need to de define, design the learning and teaching strategies um, in such a way that students are being involved uh, in the education, that they have the space to learn to be involved and the room to fail and to be supported in this. We need to make your use of digital learning in the best way uh, to make sure that the students are involved with each other and with the teacher and that they achieve the learning outcomes. And in all of these processes, we already also need to involve the students, not just to achieve uh, high quality, but also to train them to be engaged. Um, I have some, some policy papers that ESU has to, if you want to learn uh, more about it, but I'm really looking forward to having a discussion about all of this with you as well. Thank you, Ruben. It was very, very interesting. Um, and also you covered many, many topics. Uh, I see that we already have a question in the chat. Uh, thank you from Julie. Thank you very much from your, this perspective. Do you have any service on student use of LMS? Are they keen to use LMS or is it already something outdated for teaching and learning practices in higher education? Do you have any feedback from students themselves? And what is your take on this? Oh, a very specific question. So uh, you're talking about the, the learning management systems that are out there. Um, I don't have a, like a survey ready to send you or something about the student use of these platforms. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's absolutely not outdated to use learning management systems. I think what students are actually longing more uh, most for is a clear point of entry for uh, education, because often there's a lot of tools out there, um, especially if teachers are using their own tools to achieve their own goals in their own courses as well. And sometimes that just is becomes way too many platforms. Um, and that's a challenge that students face. So if there's one uh, learning management system that can integrate everything and offer a really clear vision um, and overview of, of all the materials and the learning processes, that is the most important thing for students, I think. Um, and also, yeah, the, these learning management systems offer so many different functionalities, also regarding learning analytics and, and AI, uh, which I didn't talk about, but I'm very passionate about as well. Um, and it's important to choose the learning management system that is able to achieve the pedagogical vision uh, that you have as a teacher and as a, a higher education institution. And I think that students uh, feel this is as well that we want the, the platforms that fit best with the education um, you need to, to mix and match the goals and the, the way that you achieve those so that's kind of what I have to say what I can say about that if that answers your question 
Thank you. If anyone else has any other question, feel free to either write them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, it can be a question to Ruben, but also to Maya, Dragana, and, and feel free to, to ask. Um, well, Ruben, I, I also have some questions. You spoke about the student-centered learning, well, quite a lot. And uh, we saw uh, before with the discussion with Maya, Dragana, and Dragana that uh, it can be sometimes um, surprising or disturbing for students and teachers um, at first, at least, even if it's something that um, have, has a lot of benefits as we also saw. What do, you, what do you think about this aspect and how to deal with that? Yeah, that's um, something that is sometimes surprising to me as well, also as a student, like sometimes you, you get this, um, uh, this, this freedom, um, and, and autonomy and then students are, yeah, like I heard, maybe angry or, or uh, confused because there's no structure. Um, and that's a really difficult thing. And like I said during the presentation, for that, we need to address this from the first day of education, uh, of, of, well, education in general, but especially in higher education, because I think this stems from just a, a lack of being used to this. And of course, if we train the students to be, um, well, participate in this really passive answer response kind of education, then the moment you try something completely different, of course, they're not used to this and they don't know how to handle it. Um, and that's not the fault of the students. That's really the, the, the problem with um, how we've been addressing this in the, the uh, entire study program. Um, so for that, it, you need to start small, of course, uh, in this first year, in the second year, in the bachelor's program, um, introduce these, these smaller aspects of, of freedom um, where you give the students responsibility and autonomy to achieve some learning outcomes. Uh, give them feedback as well. Um, really short uh, and, and quick and personal feedback is super important for students. Um, and that way you can kind of build on this. And then in the end, you can have these really bigger uh, courses where, where you have more freedom um, for students and really kind of throw them in the deep end of the pool. Uh, but by that point, they will already have learned how to swim. Um, so they will maybe be, uh, be able to do that in a different way. Um, and the other, the other way of that as well is when we try to engage students more, uh, sometimes that becomes a really prescriptive thing like, okay, we will have an assessment every week and you need to be present at the lectures and you need to be uh, participating in all of the evaluations um, and everything will be graded in order to motivate students to be um, active. And that also doesn't always work very well because this can become very overwhelming and overburning for students because of course there's so many other courses that they're doing as well. Um, and there again, this autonomy of students is super important uh, to make sure that they're motivated and take the responsibility. But again, it's a process of really teaching them all of this from the, the first day of, of their education. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I see that we have a very long question from Carmen. Carmen, do you want to ask it uh, out loud? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> I was just uh, listening to you and I was kind of reflecting and uh, writing the question and the question become longer and longer as, <laughs> as I was listening. But I was just thinking that certainly the, the world has changed so much, not only because of the pandemic, before pandemic, things were completely different. And uh, uh, I, I see the teacher-centered approach being really important before there was access to so many knowledge and so many tools and uh, but of course now things are different we have a lot of access to a lot of things and uh, that has to uh, turn around and uh, teachers should actually be guiders I think uh, giving advice to students which are the good resources what is going to be relevant for you how you are going to be able to implement your knowledge in your future work and so on more practical and more you know uh, like uh, deep inside the, the, the topic but then I thought if uh, students should uh, take a more uh, active role, which I'm totally supportive, I think student-centered uh, learning is, is the key to get the students interested and uh, 
to address a time and, and so many other uh, topics. I was just wondering if you think that this will actually trigger more, a more participative attitude towards life. And, um, but then I was listening to these uh, students, Anna and Dragana, thank you very much. And they, Dragana in, in particular, she was a bit scared at the beginning when uh, the, they started to, to do the, the module with uh, Maya she was scared of uh, leaving the comfort zone. And then my question finally is, how do you think that uh, teachers, lecturers, um, I don't know, uh, trainers, whoever, could actually encourage students, especially young students, to, to leave this comfort zone, to, have, to encourage this attitude more participative, how do you think we can do that? And you, Ruben, of course, but also Maya, maybe you want to comment. Yeah, I think this is a, a really important question that we need to, to discuss. And if I think really concretely on how to achieve this, because I, I've talked a bit already about, we need to train students uh, from the beginning to do to, to this. I think one thing is really uh, creating a, a safe and supportive space uh, for them to, experiment with this and to learn how to fail as well. Um, and for that, I think feedback is incredibly important. Um, like having short things and in where they can uh, engage with the material. It, it's difficult to, to speak about all kinds of different uh, things because every study field is different, of course. But if you have short discussions, if you have short assignments, uh, exercises, projects, um, Having intermediate feedback uh, where students are supported um, and told, okay, you're doing this well and you can do this better. I think that gives a lot of confidence and motivation um, and that will slowly help them to build out of the comfort zone. Uh, and of course that can't be done with just one professor for a big course. Um, so engaging uh, other people as well, uh, such as um, teaching assistants, student assistants, um, having peer to peer, mentoring as well. I think those are kind of things that maybe help students to leave this comfort zone. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen, on this question. And uh, I, I'm also puzzled <laughs> with, with this, how to, how to create space uh, to, for students to exit their comfort zone and how to stay in this space in between not to try to close it too soon, because I think the most relevant learner, learning actually happens in this space in between comfort zone and what we could say learning outcomes. Um, I agree, I agree very much that uh, with Ruben that uh, feedback, feedback is important. Uh, what I see when students uh, came I teach uh, on the first and the second uh, and the second year and the third. So I see I, I can follow uh, uh, I can follow students and see how they actually change. And what I see is like change from um, let's say more dependent attitude to more independent, so more from let's say child to an adult like taking, I think it's, it has a lot to do with taking, uh, taking responsibility. And I think um, we need to, as what I feel as a teacher, I need to experiment and adjust how much structure and when to uh, enable space for freedom. So I think it's a, it, it is a really, uh, it really depends on the atmosphere and the students and what I think now thinking about that is maybe if we, if we focus on a group as a whole and not on particular students, maybe it is easier to be in discomfort. So stu student not to have only individual task, but to, uh, but to work with other, with other students, I think it really helps 
to be to be in this comfort and to to be confused and to to create because uh, we say like um, we need to create a group not uh, not to have a class but really to create sense of belonging among students so then they feel they learn more from from each other and they can uh, they can work uh, on specific tasks instead of uh, being alone in their in their own learning what i struggle with is i was always more prone to be a facilitator and a moderator and it is more it is closer to my own personality let's say but what i found uh, that i really had to develop uh, as a lecturer like I think traditional, what we call now traditional teaching is very re relevant as well. So to also provide relevant content and discussion where people, where the students can work with, because sometimes I remember also from students reflection, and I'm also curious to hear from them because this is also like really, really important, important question for us. And it's good to discuss. Uh, there was, um, I like to work with other colleagues from other institutions, so there was a guest lecturer, Adriana Zakharievich, uh, and she, she, had a, uh, she had a presentation and a lecture on feminism, and it was, let's say, it was a lecture with discussion, but very, like, organized speech, let's say, and it was, it provides some provided some kind of framework for students because if we only discuss about safety and women I think um, it would be somehow airy but then with uh, with co very concrete knowledge and content student could could organize their experience so I think it's good to have a balance between lectures and uh, individual and collective task. That's what I what I learned, and I have to say I'm still struggling with uh, with that. So thank you, thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Um, do anybody else has any other questions? If not, we can probably move forward. I just wanted to get back a little bit on the digital aspect. Um, I'm on digital technologies, so you, you both said that in a way digital technologies can offer new opportunities for student engagement, especially you, Ruben, but at the same time, you both said that there needs to be a, a mix you know, between digital and face-to-face, -face because what is important is to create a sense of belonging and collaboration, and do you think this can be done online, fully digital, or, well, you probably partly answered already the question, but what would you say? What are the benefits and what are the limits of uh, digital yeah. technologies? Well, I think now we are faced with this, very much faced with this question. How do we create community? How do we create belonging in digital space? I think, uh, I really think it's possible, but we cannot apply learning methodology we have uh, in physical space to do the same in online online setting and what i notice in different webinars conferences that we somehow feel comfortable with uh, with presentations discussions so we somehow find a way to navigate around digital space uh, we uh, uh, in Atkal Network, a three uh, network, network on active uh, uh, active democracy and citi citizenship. Uh, I, I always forget the whole <laughs> title. But anyhow, we had uh, we wanted to create a community among uh, members uh, members of the of the network, and we started with personal stories. We ask we ask uh, we ask people who came who joined to share to share their object in space to uh, somehow mix 
their physical surrounding with uh, with digital. So I think it's always good to. I think it's always good to uh, work on the both on the both scapes, like on digital and physical and really to try to build relationships instead of focusing on content. What I think it's really difficult is that um, we are mostly present to our talking. If we do not talk in, talk in digital space, we are not present somehow. So this is really a challenge how to what kind of methodology to use so we can be physically more present. Uh, I like to work with uh, visual tools, with uh, photos, with videos, with collage. And what I found really good in digital space that you can really create an archive. So whatever you do, you have it online. And I think that's really valuable for learning because in physical space, sometimes you just have flip chart and you, they are somewhere in your office and you never look at them. But uh, in digital environment, you can really uh, build something. You can really work on, on material together and you can work on the same material at the same time. So this, I think we need to explore and experiment how we can work with all this um, with to mix uh, things we have in our physical environment and uh, to work uh, to bring that to digital world and within these dialogues that we organize within s3 article network uh, one of our colleagues actually took laptop and take us uh, for a walk um, around his apartment and that was that was beautiful that change something. So I think working with aesthetic and working with space and uh, acknowledging that we are, although if we are in digital work, in online space, we are still uh, physically present in our space with our bodies. So I think somewhere around, around these topics, around these, let's say, questions or ideas we can we can build this um, sense of of belonging and uh, yes definitely international community i mean being able to work internationally is really a, an asset yeah i i absolutely agree with this like the what's incredibly important is the sense of belonging and community if you have this and the social interaction this sense of community then students will be more comfortable to leave their comfort zone as well uh, to go back to the, the previous question um, and if they feel that the learning is relevant uh, they will um, they will also come to the learning uh, experiences and to, to the learning and teaching that is offered now if you, your question is can this be done fully online um, I think it is possible but only for certain students because we see that some students are actually longing for a a very flexible approach, like students that are working, having care duties and so on. Um, and for them, such a fully online approach uh, might be the best. And if we make use of those pedagogical principles, principles like, like we just mentioned, um, that, that maybe work out, can work out. But for traditional um, higher education institutions and more traditional students, I don't think that's what we should go to. I think, think we should always continue having some kind of face-to-face -face, uh, aspect as well. Uh, and maybe to go quickly to this this question that I saw here in the chat like about blended learning um, for the transition to student-centered learning. Yes, I, I think so, um, because blended learning can offer this diversity of methods and can allow students to have more autonomy uh, in choosing uh, what learning materials that they will engage with and how they will do this. Uh, because with blended learning, you can have more materials offered and also adaptive materials if they can automatically maybe give feedback and, and change based on um, the student's history. Um, so, so yeah, that's really shortly for me. But unfortunately, I will have to leave now because I have to leave for a physical meeting. Uh, I'm very sorry about this. Um, but it was really great to, to be here with uh, all of you and to hear some very interesting questions. Um, and good luck with the, the rest of the project. And I hope to see you again.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruben, for your participation. Nice meeting you. Thank you. It was interesting to listen. Insightful. Thank you very much. All right. See you all. Bye bye. Bye. So I can um, address the question. Do you think that blended learning will help a lot for this transition of teacher centered to student centered learning? And once uh, when we started uh, teaching online, my colleague and a friend said like, good teacher is a good teacher in any setting. So we need um, the, the, I mean, we need some time to, to adjust, but I think this uh, attitude of being student center or teacher centers really depends. Um, I think it does not depend so much on the content, context, but really can, uh, is something uh, more in uh, implicit, implicit philosophy of teacher than, than it's due to the context where we work in. So I think we always need to question our epistemology of teaching, what are our beliefs, uh, how do we practice them, and we can do that in both, uh, both settings. But it is, I think, even, um, um, I think last year or the end, after two years of online teaching, um, especially at the, the, the class, I, uh, the course I teach, Philosophy of Adult Education, um, sometimes it was very frustrating because students would uh, just turn off their cameras, they wouldn't speak, I would ask questions. So it, uh, it, uh, I, I'm not sure, it can even alienate more students from teachers. So I'm not sure if, uh, if it helps, <laughs> to be honest. And I think many of my colleagues face this uh, uh, squares frustration, you just see names and, uh, and you talk and you have no idea to whom you're talking to. So oh, thanks God, <laughs> we are back face to face. But I still think, uh, uh, I still think we can use uh, digital tools. But yes, as you, as you said, blended learning can, can work well. Thank you, Maya. Um, well, I would like to, to thank you all, Maya, Anna, and Dragana. Thank you for, for being here with us.